Hello and welcome to the third update of the Solicitous Solicitor. So we're going to start off with the London Library. Here it is, Murray's Compendium of My Favourite Poisons. A witching title, read on. It says, Chinaberry, Melia Azadera, is a tree of warm, temperate regions producing panicles of fragrant purple flowers, followed by pale yellow berry-like droops about half an inch across. Sounds lovely, doesn't it? Not half as lovely as solving this case, Watson. Of course. The fleshy pulp of the fruit contains a paralyzing nerve poison. When distilled into its crystalline pure state and ingested, only 0.05 grams is enough to prove fatal to the most hearty of men. Heart action stops immediately and permanently. No known antidote exists. The presence of the poison can be detected by its faint smell reminiscent of lilac. Old HR certainly knows his poisons. My favourite poisons. Now we are going to speak to the partners. Well, two of the partners. Whitney Cartwright is the first. Mrs. Cartwright? Mrs. Cartwright? Oh, I'm sorry. I've had such a difficult time these past days. Tuesday I came home to discover this. I received a note at the office. I know everything. I did not know I could have been so blind. If you love him, I will not stand in your way. Whitney, oh my. And my husband was gone. I have not seen him since. He must have found out about Mr. Tuttle and me. It's ironic, but Mr. Tuttle broke off the affair two and a half months ago when he told me he was in love with another woman. I tried to patch things up, but Melvin wouldn't hear of it. Do you think me dreadful to have done such a thing, Dr. Watson? <coughs> Why, I... no, I suppose. My husband worked morning, noon and night. I needed to be loved. Yes, so... Uh, who do you suppose found it necessary to tell your husband about the affair? I can't imagine, and why they would wait until after it was over to expose it leaves me baffled. Have you any idea where I might find your husband? I wish I did. I sent our butler to inquire at the Criterion Club, but I don't know for certain. If you do find him, Dr. Watson, promise me something. Anything, Mrs. Cartwright, within reason. Please, please tell him that I love him, and I swear I'll make it up to him. Oh, wow. I don't know what I was expecting, but I was not expecting that. And the Criterion Club is a place where we can go. Anyway, we are concentrating on this collection of visitations now. And the next one it will be to Cedric Livingston. Are you acquainted with Mr. Melvin Tuttle? Tuttle. Tuttle. No. Oh, isn't he Swarthmore's associate? Yes, I suppose I may have met him once. I assume you are a friend of Mr. Swarthmore's? Hardly. I've done a bit of business with the firm. We've had several formal meetings and two or three business lunches. That's about the extent of it. Something tells me there's more to it. But I could be wrong. So to round off the partners that we will visit, well, their residents, shall we say, Cartwright was not at home. We were going to visit Sir Sidney Sloan. It is terrible, simply terrible. He was such a fine young man. Consider me completely at your disposal, sir. Thank you, Sir Sidney. I am interested in Mr. Tuttle's promotions within the firm. Well, Swarthmore and Cartwright were responsible for those. You see, some three years ago, I partially retired from the firm. Do you know if Mr. Tuttle was qualified for the job? Oh, I trust Whitney and Henry's judgment implicitly. Do you know much about the contracts Mr. Tuffle was working on? Only the Heathcliff account. August Heathcliff, a prominent textile manufacturer. He asked me to conduct negotiations on an international merger. And when the preliminary work was completed, I turned things over to Mr. Cartwright. And Tuttle assisted him. I understand Mr. Cartwright left the firm's offices quite suddenly on Tuesday. Yes, evidently for personal reasons. 
Well, I was aware that the Heathcliff contracts were due to leave by the morning post, so I did talk to Tuttle about them. And he told me that he'd have no problem meeting the deadline because Miss Walker had agreed to stay late and assist him. Swarthmore appeared shortly after that and volunteered to work with them as well. Everything seemed to be in hand. Tell me about your meeting with Mr. Diggs on the day of his resignation. Harold Diggs was a fine, experienced solicitor of very high caliber. And he was quite insulted that the promotion went to Tuttle. Do you find the choice odd? Well, as I've explained, it was not my decision. Did Mr. Diggs threaten you or Mr. Tuttle oh, in any way? No, no, heavens no. Diggs was angry, but the thought of him threatening anybody is thoroughly ludicrous. Okay, so our fifth location, well, we did have votes for six locations, but unfortunately Alice Spring lost out to Richard Mainhart in the selection, well, the randomization. Mr. Swarthmore, Mr. Mainhart! Swarthmore, you say? Yes, Swarthmore! Well, he delivers papers and I sign them. <laughs> Terribly kind of him, for I rarely get out much, you see. Yes, yes I can see. <laughs> oh. So we will be sending the irregulars off and they will be visiting the British Museum. Let's see what they can find out. Okay. And that is it for now. Voting is now open again. I'll see you again in two or three days. Thank you for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.